Hi, um, Abru. I'd like to welcome everyone to. I feel like I should be walking around. No, it's fine. Um, welcome to the seventh day of reparations to African people on this amazing, amazing tour, which is happening, hosted by the Abru Solidarity Movement. And to those who will be watching this video, where am I looking? Those who will be watching this video from Perth, Australia, where it will be sent shortly after recording this, um, Uhuru to Perth, Australia. So, um, my name's Connor. I'm the local coordinator of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement here in New York City. And I'm also the chair of the International Recruitment and Membership Office. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, that is sponsoring this event. So, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is the organization of white people under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. And our work that we do accountably to the African People's Socialist Party is organized in our own communities, white communities, our families, our friends, our loved ones, to take a principled stand of material solidarity with black power and African liberation. The party formed USM as a place for us to work under the leadership of the poor and working class black community. And to really answer the demand for white people, well, to go back into our own communities and address this. Um, I want to thank this space. We don't have anyone from the space here. But they were going to renovate, and they held off the renovation by a day. So we appreciate that, <laughs> giving us this space. So shout out, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it's really significant that we're holding this event here in New York City. Um, some of you may know this, but the African People's Socialist Party was based in New York City in the early 80s. Um, and solidarity work was also based here. So I don't know, maybe the speakers will speak to that a little bit. But um, New York is really the heart of the global parasitic capitalist system. And so the fact that we're having this event here is just really, I mean, we'll see, you'll see. You'll see. <laughs> um, we actually do a walking tour here in New York that goes through Lower Manhattan and talks about all the financial institutions and how they all were built through you know, the theft of African labor and the murder and the genocide against the indigenous people here. Um, and uh, you know, people, like just normal people, I just don't even know the basic history about what's happened here and what, you know, what we're walking over when we walk down Broadway. You know? um, but you know, 30 years after the party was here, now we have a thriving organization of white people running around talking about reparations under the party's leadership here in New York. So, it's really been, you know, an amazing progression, and I'm really honored to be a part of that myself. So just some housekeeping things as we get started. Please turn your cell phones off or put them on. Turn your cell phones off rather than putting them on silent. You know, the phone or something. Um, we've got AV and TV taking um, photos and videos, so that's covered. You don't need to use your phones for that, and all the videos and the photos will be available after the event so you can enjoy that. Please sign in. Thank you. Um, I encourage everyone to have a pen and paper. If you need a pen and paper, um, raise your hand because we're going to have Q&A after the, um, could, yeah, thank you. Can we get a pen? Yeah. Um, we'll have Q&A at the end of the event, so I encourage you to hold your questions. Um, you know, we're not going to have question answered during the presentations, but at the end, you know, we really want you to you know, take the mic, um, make your statements, or you know, ask your questions. Bathrooms are there, down the hallway. They're open. They weren't before, but they are now. Um, and we did a security check on everyone coming in, and we really appreciate your cooperation with that. We have to understand that um, you know, this is a movement led by African people engaged in a deep political struggle, and the security measures are for the protection of our respective guests and for everyone here, so thank you. Um, Okay, so we can't go any further without first acknowledging a tremendous guest that we have in the room. Um, saluting the incredible founder and leader of the Uhuru Movement, an idol of mine <laughs> in so many ways, um, and also the leader of the Solidarity Movement as well. He's our leader too. And he's really changed the course of human history with his just constant, unwavering, ironclad commitment to the liberation of Africa, African resources, and African people, Chairman Omali Nishitana. I can't, I can't believe I'm hosting an event with chair, the chairman here. Okay. I also want to recognize and salute the African woman genius whose leadership has led 
the Black Power Blueprint, which is like the main campaign we're raising resources for in USM, and it's just so central to all of our work, and it's just totally transformed the conditions of the African community in St. Louis. Um, Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshitela. Salute the entire African People's Socialist Party and some of the comrades who are here, including um, Nana Yaw Grant, the Northeast Regional Coordinator, Dexter, um, Rafiq Arunde, um, Chimaranga. I also want to salute um, Black is Back Coalition comrade Lisa Davis, who's here, Nahuru. Right. So can we have a round of applause for them? Yeah. 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 Uh, Rafiq, and I don't know if Arunde is here, but we have some other um, forces here as well. So salute you. Um, I want to appreciate the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, my leadership in the Solidarity Committee, um, who's literally the first person, white person, to answer this demand for white material solidarity to black power. Um, and this was over 42 years ago, and she's continuing to lead that work to this day with more vigor and passion than anyone, <coughs> really anyone, um, Chairwoman Penny has. My leader on the, the National Steering Committee of the Uru Solidarity Movement, um, who's here from St. Petersburg, Florida, and also ran um, an electoral campaign, speaking of today, electoral politics, ran a campaign um, in St. Petersburg, Florida, under the leadership of the party and Akile Anai, on the platform of unity through reparations. Jesse Neville, Uru. <laughs> I threw in two other things I just want to say briefly in terms of um, linguistics. There's some words that our speakers are going to use that I just want to make sure everyone you know, understands what is being said. So we're using the word Uhuru. Um, it's the slogan of the Uhuru movement. Everyone in the Uhuru movement says it. And it was first used by the Kenyan Land and Freedom Army uh, to push back British colonialism. I mean, they didn't just use that word, but they used a lot <laughs> of things. And that word was definitely a big part of that struggle. Um, and using a huru is intended to really keep African freedom on our minds, morning, noon, and night, all the time. It really needs to be at the forefront of our consciousness. And for white people that are in the, in the work, we're called on to say that word as well, because African liberation is our responsibility as well. So, a huru. The other word I wanted to speak to was um, the word African which will be clear throughout the presentations um, today. But the understanding of the African People's Socialist Party is that all black people around the world are African people, regardless of where they've been dispersed by colonialism, European domination, etc. So you hear that term, and that's a little background to there. Okay, so we're here tonight for the Worldwide Days of Reparations to African People Tour. Um, it's a massive fundraising, outreach, recruitment, everything campaign of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. It's the biggest local event. This is the biggest event we've done in New York as part of the local work here, um, of the solidarity work. The tour started off in St. Louis, Missouri at the site of the Black Power Blueprint, which we'll see a lot about in a moment. And next, it went to Huntsville, it went to St. Petersburg, Florida, Gainesville, Florida. Last night was a double event in Philadelphia and Asheville, North Carolina. And tonight, we're in New York. New York. <laughs> And then next it's going to Boston on Thursday, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and then there's the event in Perth, Australia, which you know, our forces in Perth, Australia will be watching. So it's really indicative of this international scope of the work. The tour is really a call to action. It's about galvanizing us as white people with the most pressing questions of our times. What is our role and responsibility in the struggle for black power and socialism? What is the way forward out of this downward spiral of crisis and despair that we see in white society as a direct result of um, a deepening economic you know, crisis? Um, so before I bring up our first speaker, and I just want to jump right into the program, we'd like to show a brief video of um, the project I've been mentioning, the Black Power Blueprint, which is being implemented by the nonprofit arm of the African People's Socialist Party, the African People's Development and Empowerment Project, sorry, Education and Defense Fund. There's a few different nonprofits, so that's the one. And um, let's take a look. <laughs> is a black-led self-determination project in St. Louis, Missouri by Black Star Industries. We are embarking on an ambitious goal to rebuild our own African community, and we need you on board. 
With your donations, we are building the Uhuru House Community Center, the One Africa, One Nation Marketplace, and the Community Garden in the historic O'Fallon neighborhood. On Goodfellow Boulevard, in a once thriving community, we are building the Uhuru Chico Community Commercial Kitchen, a bakery and cafe, and the training center for the African Independent Workforce Program. The conditions faced by black people in America today demand that we seize the future for our children. The African community in St. Louis, like others around the country, face poverty, joblessness, poor schools, and substandard housing. We see wealth, opportunity, and prosperity on one side of town contrasted by deep poverty and despair on the other. The Black Power Blueprint will impact on our city through genuine social and economic rebirth for our community, empowering our community with sustainable job creation and commerce, attracting and supporting Black culture and arts. Black Star Industries, partnering with the African People's Education and Defense Fund, has built Black community-owned and operated institutions of economic development and self-determination for over 35 years. From Oakland to Philadelphia to St. Petersburg, Florida to Huntsville, Alabama, we have sustained community-funded commercial kitchens, a wellness center, furniture and consignment shops, event spaces, and other community-based initiatives and programs. And now, we need your support to realize this visionary project in St. Louis, Missouri. We're talking to owner Zanae Isatella, manager of Black Star Industry. Owner, what is your vision for this amazing project that you're for? Well, right now we have community uh, centers in Oakland, California and St. Petersburg, Florida. So we're going to duplicate this same center and make it a rental center for the community. You can have your birthday party here, you can have weddings here, you can have anniversaries here. You can have baby showers, anything that you can imagine, you can have it in this space. As you can see, we're on a major construction and we need major donations to complete the flooring, the carpentry, the HVAC, our stage, and our lighting. So what's going to be upstairs? We're going to have offices upstairs. The first office we're going to have, of course, is our nonprofit, which is the African People's Education and Defense Fund. We're going to have an office for Black Star Industries as well as the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement National Headquarters Office upstairs as well. Owners and name, where are we now? And what is your plans for this space? Yes, well, we are right across the street from the new Uhuru House, and we really need the donations to really make this uh, a reality. What we want to do is we want to demolish both of these commercial properties, clean up this lot, we have a garden on the other side. We want to make a community garden. We also want to make this an event space where we can hold our One Africa, One Nation marketplace so people can come in in the community and create a community uh, commerce and economic development for our community. Now we're at the future home of the Ahuru Chico Kitchen at Goodfellow Boulevard. What is your vision, DC owner, for this space? Okay, first I want to say that Jiko is a Swahili word that means kitchen. So this is going to be a licensed commercial kitchen and cafe and bakery. So we're sitting in this beautiful space where people will be able to come in and purchase the African comfort food as well as our amazing Uhuru foods and pies. This is going to serve as our community licensed commercial kitchen where people can come and prepare their food. They have a licensed commercial kitchen or a venue for them to be able to jump off and start their own business. In the back of the building, we're going to house a classroom that's going to be for the African Independence Workforce Program that's going to be dealing with the mass incarceration of African men and women who come out of prison and really don't have an opportunity to go back into society to work. We're going to be teaching them how to be owners of their own future, how to own their own businesses. We also have a space where we're going to be doing our distribution and this is where the trucks can actually come into the gate, pull up into our building and drop off all the goods and services that we need to, you know, uh, be able to have our products on site at all times. So another feature of this amazing building is, of course, the outside. 
where we're going to be doing our own garden, where we're going to be growing our own food that's going to be prepared in our own kitchen. And also it's going to serve as a venue for um, seating. We're going to have seating on the outside and we're going to have entertainment. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and I support the Black Power Blueprint. These economic development institutions are critical to Black Power, economic development to the Black community. So I'm calling on you to support these institutions, support the Black Power Blueprint. I was born and raised here in St. Louis. I'm utilizing my skills to create a better future for your children and mine. The plumber's ready to start on team. We need a short donation to make this happen. Donate today. Spread the word. Visit our websites for more information and follow us on social media to keep up with the progress of the Black Power Blueprint. It's awesome. It's amazing. Um, so that's the Blue Black Power Blueprint project, and this is the party initiative that um, all the resources raised from the Days of Reparations tour is going towards. And um, I hope that this video can give you a sense of like the concrete nature of the work that the party is doing. And um, I always talk about how the success of the party is the most persuasive aspect of, of its work. So now it's an honor to introduce our first presenter. Um, the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee. She's been a member of APSC since its founding in 1976, um, carrying out uh, Chairman O'Malley Chatella's scientific strategy by organizing members of the colonizing settler nation um, to break our allegiance with imperialism and unite with principled material solidarity with the African Revolution. She's the author of the book, which you can get in the back. You can even have her sign it today. Um, which is called Overturning the Culture of Violence. It's really an incredible book that's been important. Yeah, Gil's holding it up there. Um, and uh, yeah, so sh I, it's very, very appreciative of Abu. Um, so please welcome to the stage Chairwoman Penny. Right. Hello, I really want to welcome everybody here today. Thank you for coming out to this six-stop event on the, the tour of the Days of Reparations to African People. I salute all of you for participating. I salute Connor. And before I say anything else, I just want to say on this incredible video, we don't, unfortunately, we also need to show the after, and I don't know yeah. if there's a time to do that, yeah. but so many of these projects have been completed, yeah. and you yeah. must see them, and you. You know, if we don't have a chance to see that tonight, you will be able to see it. You can see it by going to blackpowerblueprint.org. You can also donate there as well. But there's all kinds of videos, photographs, and it just shows the incredible movement that is building there on the north side of St. Louis, Missouri, which is deeply impoverished. Um, there's two cities of St. Louis. And when we say there's two Americas, the two cities of St. Louis, the south side is the um, very opulent or uh, certainly well-to-do white community and deeply impoverished, it looks like a bombed out community on the north side. And this has been an incredible victory of the uh, African People's Socialist Party to be in St. Louis, where just four years ago, Mike Brown was murdered by the police and his body was left in the sun for four hours. And there was incredible resistance in the African community and the African working class of St. Louis. And this Black Power Blueprint is transforming that situation. And they have raised, among other things, they were able to take down those two condemned buildings across the street. They have raised a 50-foot flagpole with a beautiful, amazing 25-foot red, black, and green flag. And it is an inspiration to the community. People, African people bring their children by and take pictures. It's just really, really powerful to see. So I just want to say that. And I want to salute Chairman O'Malley Chatella, who is our leadership, as Connor said, who has been fighting for the liberation of Africa and African people 
for 50 years, and I, I'm going to talk more about that, and who created the African People's Solidarity Committee as an organization of the party to go into the white community to organize other people, to stand in solidarity with the liberation of African people and to be able to raise the question of reparations. And I, I definitely want to salute Chairman, uh, Deputy Chair Ona Sine Shetela, who we saw in this video, powerful, one of the powerful, one of the many powerful uh, women leaders of the African People's Socialist Party. She is the deputy chair. She coordinates the projects. She has lived on the ground there in St. Louis, coordinating these pro pro uh, projects with her steel-toed boots on for about a year now, and is just a formidable, formidable force that is making this uh, transformation there. And I want to salute the African People's Socialist Party, who is our leadership who just had their seventh Congress in St. Louis just a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, um, bringing together African people from around the world to plan the next five years in the struggle for the complete liberation of Africa and African people. And, you know, I want to salute Connor and, and Jesse, who's the chair of the Uber Solidarity Movement, and all of you who helped make this event happen tonight. And, you know, I, it's very, it is very emotional and very powerful to be on this tour. We've been in Huntsville, Alabama. We've been in Gainesville, Florida. We've been in St. Petersburg, Florida. We have been in St. Louis. And we were in Philadelphia last night. <clears throat> and here we are in New York City tonight, where I actually, under the leadership of the party, worked here, organized here in the 1980s when the African People's Socialist Party was building the first international tribunal on reparations to African people in 1982 over in Brooklyn, which was very successful, and the party had a goal to make the question of reparations a household word, and they have done that. They have done that. I believe that everybody knows now what reparations are and that they are due to African people from the white population. Um, of this country and the world. And this is what we want to talk about tonight. We want to go deeply into these questions. It's not a feel-good kind of event in that way. It's where, you know, uh, I just want to say first of all that sometimes people say to me, because our job, our job as, a, as the African People's Solidarity Committee is to talk to other white people, to, to open ourselves up because we have the ability to live in a totally parallel universe um, with everything else that's going on. We have the ability to live and not see it if we choose not to see it. And if we do see it, we have all the means to ignore it and put it out of our brains. And uh, this is why, you know, that we have to get deeply into this question. And I believe that the question of the relationship of white people and the system to African people is the key question in the world today. And I believe that I'm talking to you because you came here because you don't want to see another African child, teenager gunned down by the police in this country. Because you don't want to see the two Americas anymore. You don't want to be part of it. You don't want to participate in it. You don't want to see this system that is starving and murdering the people of Yemen right now. That is, uh, that you don't want to see another caravan of indigenous people trying to come back to their own land that was stolen from them. Where, you know, they've sent, Trump has sent 5,200 troops to that border and putting up razor wire on land stolen from the indigenous people. Yeah. And that we, you know, that we come to a place where we don't want another demonstration. We don't want another single issue. This system has to go. There has to be revolution. And to come to revolution, we have to look deeply into how the world got to be the way it is right now. And that is not something that we're going to understand from a white leftist or uh, a liberal or, or a Democrat. You know, and that there's a crisis of imperialism right now that Chairman O'Malley Shatella has 
you know, has defined, and this election, which he defines as the nonviolent struggle between two sectors of the ruling class of imperialism, is part, this particular, this particular election in particular, is part of this crisis that imperialism is facing based on the resistance of African and oppressed people around the world. And I think that we're ready for this. I think that we're ready for this and we've got to look deeply into this. And I, you know, I want to salute the comrades in Perth, Australia, who are going to be participating in this event. I think it's about four o'clock in the morning right now there. Um, but they're going to be showing this video as well. Because everywhere white people are, we are there as the settler colonizers. We are there as the oppressor nation. So Australia is America, yep. stolen land, uh, and oppressed people, the same, can, you know, the same genocide being waged against the people there, whether or whether it's in South Africa, Kenya, Israel, any place in the world, any place in the world that white people have gone and has gone as the colonizer, as the enemy. And I think that we are, we are sick of that. We want to be part of, we want to find our humanity again. And we want to be part of the human, the human struggle that's going on in this world to survive. But we can't do that lightly. We can't say, oh, can't we all get along now? No, the world doesn't work like that. We have to recognize how, how we got to be in the position that we are and what is, what is the price that has to be paid for that. And I feel that that price is a good price. It's a good price. Reparations is not a negative thing for us. It's a very positive thing because it rectifies the wrong that we have faced. So, you know, here in, here in New York, the center of parasitic capitalism, the financial capital, of the, this world system of parasitic capitalism, to me, there is something that just tells the story so much, so in such a real way, and that is the bodies buried, the bodies of African people buried under the buildings of Wall Street. Yes. Because the system is built on the backs of African people, and that tells the story right now. And that here in New York, this is a city where at one time, 40% of all white people who lived here, who were citizens of New York, held and owned Africans. That this was a slave city. The, that Wall Street was built on the sale of African people, and that African people built the wall of Wall Street. That this is where they say that, oh, we bought this land for some, some pieces of, of you know, beans or something from the indigenous people. Indigenous people who had no concept of private ownership of land that was part of the genocide against them. But this is this is the cornerstone of this society, of this system of capitalism. It was born this way. And that this is the question. It can't be reformed. It can't change. It's in its DNA. This is what it is, and it has to go. So, you know, we look at, I just wanted to say also about New York that this is a, a city of incredible African resistance. Even as, was it 1721, where there was an amazing rebellion of African people, well organized and coordinated, that covered much of the area of the city. Africans rose up and they were eventually gunned down. They were eventually hanged. In fact, two or three times as many that, as were involved in that were. They arrested and took in 70, 80, 100 Africans. Some were burned, some were hanged as a message that African people must not resist. But African people fought here in New York just as every place that they've been. And that during the Civil War, by the way, that um, New York wanted to be on the side of the Confederacy. Did you know that? Because mm -hmm. Lehman Brothers, that finally got its due in uh, 2008, was born as a, a, a cotton broker in the South and came to Wall Street where you know, it built its wealth. And 
that the whole cotton industry here in New York, the garment industry, was tied to was tied to the South and the interest of, of you know the Southern economy. So you know this is this is what New York was, and that when white soldiers were drafted to go into the um, the Union Army, they rioted and killed. In fact, they burned down an African children's orphanage. They burned it to the ground. They attacked and killed many African people at that time. They're saying, we're not fighting for um, the end of enslavement. We're, you know, we're not fighting for that. So this is, this is what New York is. And you know, I'm saying that because we spoke in, in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, where that state, there were 300 terror lynchings towards African people that murdered African people and but yet here in New York you know this is the same thing because it is the entire entire of white society that sits on this pedestal of the oppression of African people I just want to I want to salute Chairman Omali Chitella because Chairman has been fighting for 50 years and more um, from the time when he was a young organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in, in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And he saw, he was, he was arrested for tearing down a mural that hung in the city hall of St. Petersburg that depicted African people in the most hideous way, um, entertaining white people at the beach. This had been there for 30 years. The chairman tore it down as part of a demonstration and was sentenced to five years in prison in fact, I think was tried twice for that and was sentenced five years in prison and served about two or two and a half years on that charge and lost his rights. He's a convicted felon. You know, that, that experience is today. That meant so many African people today. So in the night, the chairman always says that he was fortunate to have been born in a time when revolution was the main trend in the whole world. And in the 1960s, that came to a head with the revolution inside this country, led by the African working class. And that we saw the incredible heroic struggle of the people of Vietnam, um, who defeated and kicked the ass of the US military, the strongest military on the planet Earth. We saw struggles all around the world, China and India, you know, all of this period in which the colonized peoples were winning their freedom. And this was a heady time. And for those of us who remember it, it was a time of hope. It was a time when you believed that the world was changing and that there was a future. There was everything was possible for humanity. And it was a powerful time to be alive. But the US government waged a war against that African revolution, it's called a counterinsurgency, a counterinsurgency, a war against an oppressed people rising up for their freedom and liberation. They use this, this cold military term, counterinsurgency, they call the rising up an insurgency, and this is the counterinsurgency, and the counterinsurgency is a war without terms. They do anything, they don't have a Geneva Convention, they do anything they want to a people just like they did in Vietnam, or just like they did in Kenya, where the colonizers, when, when the, uh, the people, the Africans of Kenya were rising up, and the Kikuyu people in particular were fighting and struggling, they raped the women, they broke up glass and put it into the vaginas of the women, they tortured, and this here as well, where they assassinated Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, they, fought for, um, to destroy the ideas of the revolution. And that they not only, as the chairman said, um, murdered the leaders, assassinated the leaders, destroyed organization, they, they blanketed the African community with drugs, with crack cocaine, with heroin. They criminalized the African community. So once, which only a few years before, African people I carried the moral high ground of the world. It was the moral compass of the entire world. Now, African people were the criminals, were being rounded up into the largest prison population in the entire world. 
just 2.3 million people in prison, half of them African, and the rest mostly indigenous Mexican and other oppressed and colonized peoples inside this country, that the US has more people in prison than, way more <laughs> than China, which has over a billion people population. So this was what happened. It created what the chairman called a drug economy, so that all of the other economy was wiped out in the African community. And so the chairman, we need a few more minutes, because the chairman laid out something that is really important, because he was faced with this defeat of a revolution, a demoralization of the African population that had fought so incredibly for the liberation inside the borders of the United States and it was recognized by Vietnam, by China, by the, uh, the leaders of revolutions around the world. The chairman had to look at the situation, he survived it, and his goal is and always has been the complete total liberation of Africa and African people around the world as one people, that everywhere that African people are, they are Africans. They are Africans, not African Americans. They are not citizens. They are colonized inside the borders of the United States, or Brazil, right. or Jamaica, or anything else. And this is a critical question. The chairman had to sum this up, because he was determined to find the science, to find the understandings, of what happened to that African Revolution and Marcus Garvey before him that was also defeated by a U.S. government's counterinsurgency, even though it had a membership of 11 million African, around, African people around the world based here in New York City in the ninth, early 1920s, the same thing happened. And the chairman was determined to find out how to fight and how to win how to win, and I, I just want to salute that, because this time around, African people are going to win, and this system is going to go. And that the African People's Socialist Party has organization all throughout the United States, not just organization, but an economic infrastructure that is building as the basis for black power all around this United States, in the Caribbean, in Europe, in London, Sweden, and Paris, Germany and other places, and also in Kenya, and in occupied Zania, or South Africa, in, in Johannesburg in particular, which Hauteng province, the richest province in South Africa, where African people live in shanty towns in the deepest poverty on their own land, even after the supposed victory, which was neo-colonialism installed by the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela that the revolution is still to be won there and there are young Africans on the ground as we speak who are members of the African People's Socialist Party that are organizing there for the total liberation of Africa and African people. So the chairman had to build an organization, it had to be a party, it had to be based on a political understanding, a worldview from the point of view of the African working class that turns the world right side up and shows us what the truth is that that theory, African internationalism, came, has as its basis the understanding that capitalism was born of imperialism, not the other way around. Imperialism isn't something bad that happened to a benign capitalism at some point as it got bigger and bigger. It was born by Europe's assault on Africa that in, what, 1419, Portugal, left the shores of Europe and invaded Africa and began stealing all the gold of Africa, began um, turning African human beings into commodities, items for sale that is the basis for the rise of the stock market, the Renaissance, everything that happened came because Europe had been poor and impoverished and this is how Europe became wealthy and powerful, assaulting African, African people, kidnapping them, and turning them into human machines, human trafficking of the first order. This is where it came from. This is where the wealth came from. Turning African people into machines to be worked till they die here in this hemisphere. That 
was the greatest concentration of productivity and production of wealth that the world had ever, ever known. So this is where it came from. This and along with the genocide against the indigenous people, the theft of this land, the uh, settler colonialism that we see that basically murdered and slaughtered indigenous people and giving the land to us, to our poor parents, as, as you know, white people to be able to, to participate in this. And then if we also look at the history of India or Philippines or any other place around the world, the Arab world, um, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, you will also find the horror stories of the onslaught of colonialism and what white people have done. And I say white people. I say white people because it's not just the state. And the chairman showed that, that this colonization, that this assault on Africa, the theft of the land and genocide and rape and murder is the foundation, the pedestal upon which capitalism sits. And this is the capital of capitalism right here in this city. This is the foundation upon which it sits and that the entire white population sits on that pedestal. And that's true for all of us, LGBT, women, men, every sector of this population. It's not saying that we're the Rockefellers or that we don't have contradictions with this system and with our own ruling class, but it means that we have supported, we have supported this, this government. We have identified with it. That's what patriotism is for white people. That's what it means, that we have carried it out, that we have been the state, that we voluntarily murdered, tortured, lynched, burned, tormented every possible thing, degraded African people. There were 10,000 lynchings in this country and they were carried out by white people who never, not one person, was ever brought to trial for that. It was legal. Yeah. It was just like slavery was legal. Right. Yeah. This is the system that we are born into. And as the chairman has said, you know, we are the children of the slave masters facing the children of the enslaved. And we have to address this question because nothing is going to be solved until we get there. And sitting on the pedestal doesn't mean that we have necessarily, uh, we're not wealthy or anything like that, but it does mean that we have democracy, we have access to social wealth, the ability of, of a family to, to give the money for a down payment on a house um, you know, to, to their children and to the grandchildren, passed down from generation to generation, so much so that a white, family has 22 times the wealth, the assets of an African family, and I just read an article yesterday that said that on the trajectory that we're on, that by 2020, which is basically a year from now, that white people will have 86 times the wealth of the African population, that this gap is greater and greater, and that the conditions that African people face is colonial. It is colonialism, and that we, then, are the colonizer nation. So part of what the African People's Socialist Party had to solve is what about the white people? What about that? How do, what are we going to do? How do African people take on the question of white people? And understanding that we sit on this pedestal. So the chairman made it clear to us when I came to St. Petersburg, Florida for this conference 42 years ago that it's not about racism. That they don't give a damn about racism. You know, they don't care about the ideas in their heads. What they're struggling for is political and economic power over their lives, their own state power to protect African people, to make sure that no one with racist ideas in their heads can ever hurt an African again. That, doesn't that make sense? That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. And that 
makes it very clear because when the people of Vietnam were struggling for their liberation, we didn't say it was about a struggle against racism. We said it was a struggle against colonialism and they had a right to independence. Well, this is, <laughs> this is true here. This is a colony inside this country. There are two Americas. And, and you know, what we're saying tonight is look at it, take responsibility for it, and overturn it. Yeah. And that what the, what the chairman did and what the African People's Socialist Party did, that I feel like was incredibly brilliant, was form an organization of white people that it strategically placed inside of the white population as an extension of the African liberation struggle in, white, in the white population. I think that's powerful. That's powerful. You know, it, it's not about how, what I think, if you, wanna, if you want to, you know, fight racism, join the struggle for reparations to African people under the leadership of the African Revolution. And this is not about, um, you know, reparations means going to a bar and white people buying drinks for African people. This is nothing, nothing like that. You know, I've read, I'm saying this because we've read articles about yeah. this. No, this is not about that. This is about the ability of the African Revolution to determine that, first of all, that the struggle for power, the power base of the African community, like the Black Power Blueprint and all the other places, where the African People's Socialist Party has built this, the black power base, has the ability to surround it with white people with the same understanding as you know, the African People's Socialist Party and the African Revolution inside of white power, fighting for reparations, being a supply line. We're there, we're surrounded with a rear base. And that means that the Vanguard, the advanced detachment, which is the African People's Socialist Party and the organization of African people fighting for their liberation, has the ability to have supplies, to have resources coming there. And that this is, this is the African Revolution's way of creating the redistribution of the wealth of the world under the leadership of the African Revolution with reparations, which is the stolen labor, the stolen resources, the value of, and the wealth that belongs to African people coming back to them from a very united sector within the white community. I, mean, I think that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And it makes it very clear. That it's not about that subjective thing. It's not about fighting against racism, it's saying this revolution is, is my revolution. This revolution is my revolution because all of the oppression that we see in the society of women and the whole struggle around Me Too and all of these things are the result of white power, of white power. That's our enemy. Yeah. This system is our enemy. But the African Revolution is our leadership for the future because it is creating a society and building a revolutionary struggle that ends all oppression. All oppression. Yes. All oppression. So this is our future. It's not going to be a white anarchist, a white left group, a white socialist. If you want socialism, it's here. If you want revolution, it is here under the leadership of the African working class. And this is, this is exciting. Revolution is positive. This is what we have to have. Even the planet itself can't exist, continue to exist. The same system that wiped out hundreds of millions of human beings and enslaved them has wiped out the entire planet. So I, we don't even know if it can sustain human life anymore. But I'll tell you something, white people are not going to solve that. White science is not going to solve that because white science is about uh, profit and the interest of the oil companies and everything else. The African Revolution is going to solve that. And that one thing that is very clear is called African internationalism and that is the political theory of the African People's Socialist Party because it is about not just winning the liberation of African people but 
African people are going to bring everybody with them and fight for the liberation of the indigenous people and say this is their land. They have a relationship with Unión de Barrio, a Mexican organization for 30 years working tightly together, recognizing that this land is still stolen land. It still belongs to the indigenous people and it's going back to them. And all these people coming, trying to get in this border, across that razor wire, and eventually they're going to do it, are coming to reclaim what is theirs. And this is what represents the future. And that African people are going to be free, and they also offer us an opportunity to join in this revolution. And I'm calling on you to be part of this, to take up the stand of reparations to African people. It is not charity. It is the ability to turn back, to, to um, paralyze, <coughs> ultimately paralyze the parasitic capitalist system that can't exist for a day without sucking the blood of African people and oppressed people around the world, that we can turn that back over. We can turn that back over. It is in our interest to do that and be part of a future in which all human beings can live, no one at the expense of anybody else. So I want to thank you for coming out, and I want to say unity through reparations. generation that ha gets a lot of his political education online and um, the, the vast majority of my current political education come from watching videos of our next presenter um, long videos about dialectical materialism about these different um, you know nuanced political concepts so it's it's very it's definitely an honor to be here in the same room with this person um, it's my profound honor to introduce the keynote speaker for tonight the leader whose vision and strategy has brought all of us here today in the built this movement, the leader who in the aftermath of the U.S. government's brutal counterinsurgency against the Black Revolution of the 60s, um, rebuilt a global revolutionary movement of African workers united as one nation. Um, their strategy, liberate Africa, her resources, and every African person on the planet from foreign domination. Um, as Penny mentioned, um, two weeks ago, he presided over a momentous 7th Congress that some of us here had the honor of attending. Um, the founder and leader of the Uhuru Movement, the leadership of the World Revolutionary Struggle, the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, please welcome Omali Ashitelli. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to really ex uh, extend my appreciation to uh, Kama uh, for organizing and hosting uh, this event on today, uh, Days in Reparations, and Days in Solidarity for Reparations for African People. It's been mentioned as part of a tool uh, that we've been involved in. It can also, should also be said that this is something we've been doing now uh, for years and years and years. Uh, it's a very important kind of event, in part because it gives <coughs> white people an opportunity to end your voluntary isolation from the rest of the world, uh, to come uh, and unite with African people who've served you so well, even if it has been uh, uh, at the point of the gun, and uh, an opportunity uh, to claim a scientific understanding of this relationship that we have uh, to struggle against the pure subjectivism that uh, too often informs uh, not only uh, our understanding about this relationship but our understanding of the world. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Kata and uh, Uhuru Solidarity Movement. I also want to express my appreciation to uh, Chairwoman Penny Hess, the Chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee. Uh, she has been doing this work now since uh, 1976. And a couple of people who were not born <laughs> at that time. And it has been extraordinarily consistent. I want to uh, say that, uh, that I have a tremendous amount of appreciation for your coming out. Uh, I think it's uh, 
a really bold statement, your presence. I think that um, it is uh, part of, it's been an incredible hurdle uh, for white people to get here. Uh, in, in, in because in part, uh, white people have been for the last several hundred years the subjects of history. And the rest of us have been objects of history. It's only recently that we didn't even been able to read about ourselves in the first person. Um, as a child, I, I learned to read uh, very early uh, as a child. And uh, I read stories. I read story of poor uh, Tiny Tim, you know, the uh, Christmas carols. And I learned to cry copious tears uh, for that child. Uh, but I never was able to read about Africans and learn to cry uh, for ourselves. And even my emotions uh, were colonized, if you will. Uh, and this is the reality that we have experienced as a people. So I want to express uh, uh, an understanding of how difficult it is for white people to cross over uh, this, this muck uh, that has contaminated your brains, your society, right. and everything that you have. This relationship that we have uh, with each other has been extraordinarily beneficial to white people, even people living in the Appalachians. Mm -hmm. uh, as compared to what it has meant to Africans, what it has meant to Mexicans, the indigenous peoples, and oppressed peoples around the world. It has been extraordinarily beneficial if you, you consider the fact that, uh, as Comrade President uh, Penny Hess just mentioned, the Africans who <coughs> built uh, uh, the, the walls for Wall Street, but then part of the reason it was built was to keep the indigenous people uh, from taking back their land. Uh, there wouldn't be a single address uh, in this country, a mailbox, uh, even the poor people who uh, decry the fact that the rent is too high are uh, paying high rent on stolen land. And the people whose land, who were the custodians of the land, uh, in concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. This is the reality that we are contending with, even if it's not immediately obvious to us. I think it's important uh, to say that we're not here just for some kind of purely abstract philosophical uh, discussion. Uh, we're here because we are concerned about what's happening in the world. Like me, I'm sure most of the people here don't like it, the fact that the United States government uh, is employing uh, the Saudis uh, to murder Yemen's every day. Every 10 minutes, at least one child in Yemen is dying as a consequence of the war that's funded, led uh, by the United States uh, uh, using Saudi uh, uh, forces to do that. I'm sure that most people here don't like the fact that you've got people who are starving in Iraq and starving in Afghanistan uh, as a consequence of being occupied by U.S. military forces uh, and there are other peoples around the world that you're looking at a world of permanent warfare and that Donald Trump uh, would come uh, into existence as the, as the formal head of state, uh, that people are concerned that uh, that the U.S. government under his administration would uh, unilaterally end nuclear treaties uh, w with Russia, would uh, uh, unilaterally uh, declare uh, that uh, the Iranian uh, government is now uh, under continuous assault and that would use warfare, form of warfare, starvation, uh, through uh, quarantine, economic quarantine, of the Iranian government. I'm sure that people are disgusted and concerned about that. That's why some of you were running around saying things like, feel the burn, and uh, uh, looking for <coughs> solutions. That's why we're here. And uh, many people uh, don't like the idea that we can be in a country where the police can go uh, into a playground and two seconds after having arrived, murder a 12-year-old African child in a playground with a play gun without there being any consequences. Or they could murder 
a child like seven-year-old uh, Ayanna Jones in Detroit in her sleep, in her bed, but there being no consequences to that. So I'm sure people are concerned about that. And uh, that uh, I hear that there, the people are using this incredible word fascism. Fascism uh, is, uh, uh, is around the corner, etc. And so I think that, that it's important for us to understand what the hell is going on. And also that Bernie Sanders is not the solution. And I have nothing against old people. Uh, uh, which would be extremely problematic, wouldn't it? Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I read some time ago uh, that the United States government spent a lot of money and resources sending a spaceship to Jupiter. Anybody remember that? A spaceship to Jupiter because they said it was the end of the universe. It was at the limits of the universe. And they said, we want to get to Jupiter. This is the line that they gave. They didn't say we're looking for, uh, for minerals. And they didn't say we're looking for the military high ground to dominate the world forever. And they didn't say just in case the ruling class has to get off the earth that they're destroying. <laughs> but they said that they went to Jupiter because they could discover there uh, the origin of, of the Earth, how things got to be the way they are. And that's something that we need to do. And so right now, uh, we're taking a flight to Jupiter uh, because we need to know how the hell it got to be the way it is because we want to solve the problem. And you can't solve the problem unless you identify what the real contradiction is. It is the contradiction that we are faced with because some white people don't like Africans. All the most of the white people don't like Africans. Is that the real problem? And some people say yes and, and feel uh, absolutely guilty because of the deep hidden, deep seated racism in their brains, etc., and struggle with those kinds of things. But frankly, most people around the world don't give a damn about whether you like us or not. Except your dislike for us can be expressed through drone strikes, mm -hmm. military aggression, murder in our communities, and things like that. Yes. And that understanding helps us to conclude the real question is not whether white people like us. The real question has to do with the fact that white people have the power to do things badly to us if they don't like us. And therefore, the question is not to get white people not to like us, because you could spend several generations as has already occurred, but to get the power to make sure that whether white people like us or not, you can't do a damn thing to us. In fact, that we can chart our own future. So how, how do we get this way? How do we come so deluded about this relationship? How this whole notion of the superiority of white people, and of course everybody in this room knows it's a lie because the white That's people in this right. room look in the mirror and you know just how, how significant you are how smart you are, how superior you are. You look in the mirror, you have to deal with that. How do we come to this place where the entire world uh, now uh, perceives white people as being this superior, all-knowing, uh, most beautiful? I remember when white people couldn't dance <laughs> and couldn't sing. And now I see white people controlling whole networks, uh, giving each other awards for being the best singers and the best dancers. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> So I think it's really important for us to understand that when most of us met white people, that Europe, as it is now known, because it's a relatively recent creation, that Europe, as it is now known, uh, lived under feudalism. And feudalism is the next closest thing to slavery. So that to where people were not sold as doing slavery, they were tied to the land that was owned by the nobility. Even the term landlord comes from that period. Even the thing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, comes from that period. So the landlord was the dominant force during feudalism. And, and uh, we had a situation from, you're talking about a thousand years, just about, where Europeans were starving, literally. So, so under feudalism, 
You see, this reality show they have, Naked and Afraid, well, under feudalism, that was literally true, that there were certain communities in Europe where people literally naked, had nothing to wear. This is feudalism. This, this is obviously something that challenges the notion that, that's been fed to the rest of us, how you have rescued us uh, by coming uh, to us. They, you know, Rudyard Kipling, uh, the great uh, 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 chronicle of the uh, British colonialism characterized it as the, as, the, as the white man's burden. Say so we have to go and kill and rape and take everything else. We don't want to do it, but it's our burden to bring civilization, uh, to bring civilization and Christianity to the rest of the world. Uh, so, but the reality is that Europe was in a state of starvation. Between the four years of 1347 and 13 and 52, that's four years, right? We had something like at least half the white people on the planet Earth died of plague. And that four short years, you can't have an economy of any significance if half the people die in a four-year period. And then beyond that four-year period, for a hundred years or more, that and other plagues continued to visit Europe. And so uh, much of, of how Christianity looks today uh, was informed by this, this, this deadly plague that visited Europe. That's where self-flagellation self and what have you, that's, a, that's one expression that comes from there. Because said, God must be punishing us. And uh, so in order to sort of uh, preempt uh, godly punishment, they would have marches of hundreds of people going from village to village uh, and get actually uh, whipping themselves bloody. So we can do it before God gets us. Uh, this was this was the European. This was Europe that we are talking about. This appeared they call it the Dark Ages, uh, but it wasn't dark in China. It wasn't dark in much of Africa. It wasn't dark in the Americas and what have you. This was called the Dark Ages that Europe lived with an experience, and uh, we call it Europe now. But there was no Europe. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, within the recent period of time, much of what we call Europe and, and people who live there define themselves primarily in relationship to each other. The Normans and the Saxons and, and uh, the Celts and all of these people who were always engaged in, in warfare, this in, 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 in permanent war, that was what tribal warfare is what characterized that relationship. But the thing that happened that changed the world was that Europe went out, and I say Europe, but hands full of, hands full of Europeans went out and began to engage it. They, 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 they romanticized this great period of exploration. No, it was Europe being, stopped, being chased out by starvation, by poverty and disease, and uh, uh, be, initiated this whole process of, of what has been called as the slave trade <laughs> and the colonialism. And now, as opposed to Celts and Normans and Saxons and the rest of them engaged primarily uh, uh, in relationship, ad identifying and defining themselves primarily in relationship to themselves, they now begin to define themselves in relationship to us. This is the origin of the white man. The white man gets born through this process. Europe gets born through this process of slavery and colonialism to begin to define themselves against the rest of us. And of course, even, as you know, uh, part of what happened was the war that was made against the people in what is now characterized as the Middle East, uh, the so-called Holy War uh, that was fought. Uh, this, this looting expedition fought on the banner of Christianity uh, that continues to be fought even as we have this discussion that also began to help to shape uh, what is now the European consciousness and identity uh, uh, so that <coughs> we define the European nation really as being uh, essentially white and Christian. And, uh, and, and, and it's, a, as I said, a looting expedition. But all of this, <coughs> including the enslavement of African people, the theft of the lands that we are on now, 
the theft of this Australia that we are talking about now, uh, the theft, and this is a horrible theft as well, of uh, the lands of Palestine, uh, where Europeans leave Europe and go to Palestine, steal the land, take the land, said God gave them to them 2,000 years ago. This God that's a real estate uh, agent. And uh, 2,000 years ago, take the land, call themselves, uh, uh, change the name from Palestine to Israel, call themselves Israelis and act like they've always been there. This is how Europeans <coughs> leave Europe, come to this land, uh, kill the indigenous population, take the land. Uh, Scratch off the name. That's the first thing a criminal does when he steals something. Scratch the name off. Uh, call it America. Call themselves Americans and act like they've always been here. Uh, it, it's a lie. And it's something that's been handed down from generation to generation. And it has become a part of the fabric of the consciousness of uh, especially white people who live uh, in this country. But this is how the whole social system gets born. We have to ask the question. Uh, I was faced as a young person uh, with the question, as most Africans are here and around the world, why is it that everywhere I looked as a child growing up, uh, I would see people who looked like me uh, living in the worst kind of squalor, poverty, violence, and imposed ignorance on the one hand, but every place I looked I saw white people living well. And of course the explanation that was given to all of us is the fact, is the, the, the thing that, uh, the, the reason is that way, this great disparity in the conditions of existence between Africans and other people, and now the people who know as Europe are white people, is because white people are more civilized. You ever heard that before? White people are more civilized, and uh, in addition to being more civilized, white people are thrifty. <laughs> and the rest of us just, Waste our money, and uh, and this is the kind of uh, this is the explanation that virtually every ch African child uh, is burdened with in terms of trying to understand who the hell we are, how we happen to live in these circumstances that we live in. Uh, every African child has to live with that. Every not just the child, but even those who we send into the schools to teach our children, uh, have this kind of uh, false understanding of reality. When the, when the truth of the matter, of course, is that this difference that we are talking about is one that has come about as a consequence of slavery and brigandage. Brigandage and slavery. Whole world economy. Karl Marx asked the question, you know, how do you, how, he said that in order for there to be capitalist production, there has to be first an accumulation of capital. He said, well, in order for there to be an accumulation of capital, there must be first capitalist production. How do we get out of this vicious circle except by presupposing that there was an accumulation of capital that did not come as a consequence of capitalist production, but was a starting point. He said it was a primitive accumulation. And this primitive accumulation of capital, he said, consists of turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skin and then turning the indigenous people of the Americas into the mines and what have you, bringing up resources. It included things like the war that was made uh, against China by England in 1841-42. That was called the Opium War that, that forced China to become a nation of drug addicts uh, because China did not want to trade uh, its tea to England for opium. And so this is how Europeans do trade. You see what Trump is doing right now. They said, no. Yeah. <laughs> they said, yeah, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna take the opium. We're going to take the tea. And they fought what they call the opium war yeah. in order to force China to do this. This is how resources came uh, to what we now know as Europe and what became the whole capitalist world. It was turning Vietnam. Uh, into uh, most of, in France got most of its uh, colonial resources from Vietnam through drugs. Uh, uh, thousands of actual drug dens under French colonial domination existed in Vietnam, bringing out all kinds of resources but turning Vietnam into a country of junkies. This is, the, this is how imperialism, this is how, 
how capitalism arose. And it did not arise as something that happened in Manhattan by itself or in Manchester in England. It emerged as a world system, a world system. Capitalism was born as a world system, and it was this capitalism coming into existence that gave birth and rise to what we now know as white power. This is the reality that we're confronted with. And you cannot keep the world dominated and starving. It's a parasitic social system. And you know what a parasite is. A parasite has to have an organism of, upon which it can suck the life of. It's like a tapeworm. And you think you're doing something, you eat this little nasty meat that most of the people probably eat. And uh, sometimes it's, you have this parasite in it and you eat it and it comes, uh, it grows uh, onto you and latches onto your intestines. And it doesn't do anything except sit there and grow. If you're lucky, you got a job, you work. And to get food, you have to cook the food. You do all the work. And no matter how hard you work, you don't get any bigger at all or any stronger. In fact, you continue to get weaker, but the parasite gets bigger and bigger and bigger inside you. That's, well, that's what the capitalism is. It was born as a parasitic social system. The enslavement of African people, I was a parasite. The taking of the land of the indigenous people, that was a parasite. The theft of this land that they call Australia and the murder of the indigenous people in Australia to take and keep that land, that was a parasite. This is what we are talking about, the rise of capitalism and what capitalism is. And this is why there has to be permanent warfare because the peoples of the world will not easily surrender all of our resources and the future of our children, the destiny of our people to some parasite that wants to feast off of us. So, so there's resistance that's happening all the time. And one of the problems even that you find with the economy is that the success of the people taking back their own resources. Or you have a China that has been a, a kind of, uh, of a semi-colony for a long period of time that achieves independence, of course, as you know, at the end of the 40s, and now has become a contender with the big guys, with the, with the imperialists. You remember, some of us, uh, Remember when there used to be this saying that you don't have a Chinaman's chance. They don't say that no more. Uh, the China, China has more chances than the most of us. But China, you didn't, never heard of China marching down the street saying we shall overcome and the hands up, don't shoot, and Chinese lives matter. They, they, in fact, what they did was they sought and, and patiently. They made a revolution to unite China. And then they took over the resources that were there, and they developed a capacity that they can contend with any power on earth. In fact, we got problems with China and Africa today. And my point, of course, is that this is what's happening, and this is part of the crisis of imperialism, even contention among uh, would-be uh, imperial, imperial powers, where it used to just be Europe and America. <coughs> and the pie shrinks. The power shrinks, what happens, of course, is there's greater contention between those who have relied on being able to get all of those resources. Now they're talking about new trade agreements and uh, uh, guns and ability to take what they want from the people, to take it from Venezuela, to push uh, uh, Nicaragua back into a state of savage slavery, to isolate Cuba so that the people who America had turned uh, into prostitutes and turn their country into gambling dens for gangsters, uh, 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 now they want to push that back. And of course, Africa is incredible. So we live in a world today where 80% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive of 10 US dollars or less a day. And 50% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive of $2.50 or less a day. And when you look at Africa, you're looking at people where they work all day just to get a meal. Yet Africa is the richest continent on earth in terms of 
natural and material resources. It doesn't make any sense at all, except AFRICOM and the ongoing military aggression that's been made against Africa that was made uh, uh, in 1415 initiated by the Portuguese in terms of the transatlantic slave trade that has dispersed the African nation across the globe that has been responsible for this artificial uh, uh, national consciousness that has been imposed on us, a fake national consciousness, so that we uh, were no longer Africans as we were when we got on the ship in Africa. Now we've become other kinds of things where we can't recognize each other. Africans disappeared uh, the moment we got on the ship. And now we're no longer Africans, we're Jamaicans, we're Ghanaians. They cut up Africa uh, into 54 parcels and, and gave it out to different European powers in 1884 and 85. Uh, England, you have this. Uh, Germany, you have this. Belgium, you have this. And just shared out Africa to all these white countries. And Africa is starving. And African people around the world are starving because Africa itself has been under assault and has been, has been neutralized as a power and a force that can serve Africa and African people. That's the reality we are confronted with. So this ain't about we shall overcome. This ain't about hands up, don't shoot. We are part of a revolutionary project. I want to say what happened, of course, in the 1960s. We saw a point in history where revolution was the main trend in the entire world where the oppressed peoples of the world demonstrated their opposition to Europe and America, dominating all our resources and taking for themselves the future of our children uh, and our people. And that revolution happened everywhere, uh, all around the world. And of course, uh, what we saw during that period was a vicious counterinsurgency uh, that the United States was leading. And it murdered people all around the planet. You saw the Agent Orange, or heard about it that was dropped on the people of Vietnam, they're still suffering the consequence of that. Yes. Uh, and uh, of course, what happened uh, to Africans here, uh, and some of that is not known to many people, uh, but the prison population in this country uh, uh, quadrupled uh, in a, a relatively short period of time in this country. SWAT teams, special military operations, uh, this whole process now of the Pentagon being able uh, to have this huge budget that includes sending what they like to call surplus weapons to police stations, uh, police organizations throughout this country. How can it be a surplus for, that's been going since 1970, how can it be a surplus? That's the budget, that's the Pentagon budget. It's violation, it violates uh, uh, constitutional provisions that pro prohibits the military from doing work in, uh, in, in, the, in the country. And so now the, the police departments have become arms of the Pentagon uh, that carries out functions in our communities. That's how. Somebody could go to the police department in Dallas, Texas, when this brother began to uh, shoot back and uh, went to the police department, got a robot, uh, got C4 uh, explosives, and used the weapon to kill uh, this brother. So this is the reality we are confronted with. But, comrades, <laughs> you don't like it and I don't like it. And that's why we're here. And something is happening throughout this world, you don't have to be that smart to see it. And part of what's happening throughout this world is a real serious kind of consolidation of uh, white consciousness and patriotism. Whether it is a patriotism of the Donald Trump kind or patriotism of the Bernie Sanders kind. And I mention Bernie Sanders particularly because he is somebody that's misleading people who want a different way of life. Uh, he's telling the people that he's some kind of socialist. And he's telling the people that you can achieve uh, uh, this socialism by uh, 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 getting $15 per hour over a number of years. That ain't socialism. Socialism is when the working class comes to power. Yeah. Socialism is when the workers succeed in destroying the capitalist state and seize power and the means of control in our own hands, where the people who produce value are the ones who control the value. And the people who produce values are the ones who, con who, who control the societies where that, where that value uh, is being uh, expressed and spent. The workers have to come to power. And then when the workers come to power, they'll tell, they'll tell Bernie, 
maybe you'll get $15 an hour <laughs> over a number of years. But you know, this benevolent capitalism is not what we are looking for. Right. And it's never going to be a solution. So um, finally, because uh, I'm trying to be disciplined. I'm, I'm ca trying to be disciplined because i got to sit down. <laughs> but I do think it's important for everybody to understand that uh, we are part of the African Revolution. We're conscious of that reality. We're conscious that we are Africans. You can't be an African and an American at the same time. That's a contradiction in terms. Of, that's like being a slave and a slave master. How are you going to be both? Uh, the fact is that America was born at the expense of Africa. We were Africans when we left Africa. We were Africans when we got here. And if you don't have a certain kind of intervention from the state, uh, that's something that's easy to understand. Children understand it. <coughs> Explain it to your child. Explain it to your kindergartner garden child and that child will get it right away uh, it's those of us who have been so victimized by bourgeois colonial education that uh, have problems grappling with this so uh, I want to thank you I want to call on you to join because it's, it's we're moving beyond this time in history where we can just be consumers of information you know uh, we come out and we get all the information and we have we've got the best rap in the barbershop. Uh, uh, it's, we have to move beyond that. We have to assume our responsibility. And our responsibility is to seize control of our lives. We complain about Trump. We complain about Cuomo. We complain about all these other critics out there who, who say that they represent us. Well, they can do that because we don't actively engage in representing ourselves. You must join the struggle for reparations. That's why the question of reparations is so important because it flips the script. Yeah. It is the way that we begin to deprive the parasite yeah. of the resources that is required for its existence. It is the way for white people to rectify your relationship with the rest of the world. It is the way that white people can end this, in this voluntary isolation from everybody else where you have to live behind security bars and dump every time you think a black person is walking behind you and things like that because you're damn right he wants to shit back. And, uh, 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 but we can change all of that. We can change this relationship. And, that's, and the biggest contradiction that we have, are confronted with and one the world has been confronted with for the longest period of time is white people. What the hell are you going to do to get off your asses and stop living off the rest of the world and join with us right. in tearing this system down and yeah. building a society right. that all of us can do? So for our final speaker, um, I would like to, can we just have another round of applause for Chairman Obama? Oh, 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 so I'd like to introduce our final speaker. Um, you know, I mentioned about getting political education off of YouTube. Um, well, I was following this uh, person named Ghazi Kozo, who is a, a now the Secretary General of the African People's Socialist Party. and. Um, Ghazi was making some very compelling videos, and I saw a video where the Ghazi did with a, a white guy in it, and I was like, what? I thought Ghazi, you know, hated white people. And um, then, anyway, the video was an, an explanation of, you know, the relationship there. And um, anyway, so that person that was the white guy in that video is uh, Jesse Neville, the chair of USM, or who? Uh, Suggest that if we can, we should throw. If we haven't, we should show that three-minute. It's a three-minute video that shows the after. This is it. That's it. Okay. Yes. All right. Got it. Good. So, um, I just want to first of all, can we all give another round of applause for the incredible? And APSC Chairwoman Penny Hess, who spoke tonight. I just want to say it's an honor to be here, and as was stated, my name is Jesse Neville. I'm a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee and the chair of our mass organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And before I uh, say what I wanted to come up here and say, um, as the chairman just mentioned, we have another video 
uh, that we're going to show that is kind of like the, the before and after of the one we showed you earlier. So you saw that, that a building that was falling apart, and you saw a deputy chair and the other leaders on the ground in St. Louis talking about these resources needed to make this happen, to transform these buildings, to demolish these buildings, etc. Well, this video is called Making Black Power a Reality that shows what that campaign, the Black Power Blueprint, has already accomplished. So we're going to uh, go ahead and watch this video, and then I'll come back up and talk about how we can take part in contributing reparations to this project tonight. Uhuru. This is going on here at 2101 West Florida. This is your Uhuru House. This is your place. This black community is your community. So come on out and take part in the work that's going on down here. Because of you, we are really doing this. With more than 400 contributions, we have made our first phase goal of $25,000. You have funded the ability of hundreds of African workers and volunteers to transform a once abandoned building into this beautiful community center. All over the world have extended their support. Hundreds of us in the white community have united with this opportunity to contribute as a stance of reparations to the black community. Hundreds of you have volunteered here in person or have organized online. We can see the beginning of an entire community coming together for self-determination and power over our own lives. And now, even as we're celebrating the opening of the new World House, we're launching phase two of the Black Power Group. The demolition of the two buildings across the street. This property is the future home of a community garden in the One Africa, One Nation marketplace. Our community deserves to be in control of our own food with sustainable and healthy produce. The marketplace will function as a venue to support and create local arts, businesses, and job opportunities for the African community. Thank you for all that you have done. We still need your continued support. The Black Power Blueprint is a self-determination project in St. Louis, Missouri, led by Black Star Industries and the African People's Education and Defense Fund. We have embarked on an ambitious goal to rebuild our own African community through genuine social and economic rebirth, and we need you on board. With your support, we have quickly completed the Ahuru House in a Proper Hall Community Center, which is already functioning as a dynamic black community event space. We are now raising an additional $20,000 for the One Africa, One Nation Marketplace and Community Garden across the street. After this phase in the historic O'Fallon neighborhood, we will renovate homes for community housing. In 2019, we'll begin building the Ikuru Jiko Community Commercial Kitchen and the Training Center for the African Independence Workforce Program on Goodfellow Boulevard. We salute Chairman Omalia Chatella, who provided the visionary leadership for this project, and Deputy Chair Ona Zanaya Chatella, who made the Black Power Blueprint a reality. Donate today, spread the word, and follow us on social media to keep up with the progress of the Black Power Blueprint. So, there you have it. Very, very powerful stuff. And um, now what we're going to do is we're going to raise money. That's what we're going to do. Because when we say reparations to African people, you know, sometimes the question comes up, like, well, what does that mean exactly? Are you talking about money? And the answer is yes. Amongst other things, we are. You know, we owe money. We owe a lot of money to African people for hundreds of years of stolen value of their labor and resources and lives that has built the white world. So I just want to again say that I've had the honor of seeing uh, Chairman Amali Chatella and Chairman Penny has speak many times, but those are two of the best presentations. Oh, yes. that, that was amazing. So we're all very lucky to be at this event tonight. Everyone here is going to remember this. And I just really wanted to appreciate what Chairman Amali Chatella was saying about Bernie Sanders and socialism and really defining for us what real socialism is. Because 
the only reason I can stand before a room, any room of, of people and say I'm a socialist and not feel silly is because I'm a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party that is fighting to liberate Africa and African people everywhere and destroy the pedestal of parasitic capitalism, which as the chairman has said, is the historical precondition for real socialism to emerge. And because I can understand that by working under the chairman's leadership and embracing the worldview of African internationalism, Bernie Sanders is extremely offensive to me because he called himself a socialist, but he was the first candidate in that election to come out against reparations to African yeah. people. He was the first one to come out and say, nope, it's a non-starter, it'll never happen. So you're a socialist, which means that you support the workers of the world taking control of the value of their labor, and you support redistribution of the wealth, but you oppose the ultimate example of the workers reclaiming the value of their labor and redistributing the wealth, which is reparations to African people, which is reparations for stolen African labor. So that is, you can't just take a word and just mutilate it till it no longer means anything, which is what they do, because everybody's a socialist. I, like, Bernie's a socialist, this guy that's probably losing in Florida right now is supposedly a, so a socialist, and Trump says all the Democrats are socialists, and you can't do that to a word. So thank you, Chairman Amalia Chitella, for restoring a real definition to the word socialism. <laughs> and I also just want to salute Deputy Chair Onizanea Chitella, who is a real socialist, and you see socialism in action in the form of the Black Power Blueprint and these amazing projects that she's spearheading and carrying out Chairman Amalia Chitella's vision and all of the African People's Socialist Party, and uh, also Connor and Ed and everybody here who has been part of making this happen, all of the comrades that are here. So um, I'm gonna be joined in a few minutes by uh, Janet, who's gonna be talking about our goal for raising resources tonight. But there are a few things I wanted to say first. One is that if you are not yet a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, our goal is for every single person in this room who is not a member to leave a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And the Uhuru Solidarity Movement has three principles of unity, three basic principles of unity. One, we're under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. Number one, we're formed by, we're founded by the African People's Socialist Party as a mass organization of APSC. Number two, we organize in the white community for reparations to African people. And number three, we stand in solidarity with the right of African people to lead their own struggle for national liberation and self-determination. So if you agree with those three things and you're not yet a member, then you should join. You should join. You should become a member tonight, before you leave, of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And I wanted to say that um, Chair, uh, Chairwoman Penny has touched upon this at the end of her presentation, that this is something, the, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, APSC, is something very unique that's never been done in history before. It's not just a white group under the leadership or whatever, or a solidarity committee that's going out and building support for the African Revolution. I mean, that sounds like, that's not really what it is, it's much deeper than that. It's actually, as Chairman Penny said, and as Chairman Amali Shetela has laid out, a part of the strategy of the African Revolution. It is a strategic component of the African Revolution. It is the African Revolution extending itself into the white oppressor nation population, which is genius. It's the African Revolution arriving into white society in the form of white people who unite with being under the leadership of the party, who unite with being African internationalists, and who unite with organizing other white people to pay reparations to African people. And that's genius on so many levels. For one, it is the way that as the party is building these dual power institutions, is building black political and economic power, led by and controlled by the black working class, they're also organizing all this, the white people in the surrounding areas to defend those institutions, to act as a buffer, and to be raising resources, and as Penny said, be a supply line, to be sending resources as reparations to fund, to, to be part of building those economic institutions. And if you look at, historically in this country, any time African people have been successful in creating any semblance of economic prosperity under colonial conditions, like in <coughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma, or in Rosewood, the thing that brought those things to an end wasn't police, it was white people. Yeah. Regular white people, white lynch mobs came in 
and burned the entire thing to the ground and lynched all the Africans, men, women, and children, and babies, and destroyed it, and destroyed it. In the case of Tulsa, I believe it was, that was the first time that an, an, a domestic airstrike was launched in US borders, was against what they referred to as Black Wall Street. So it's not gonna go down like that again. And this time, it's not just about having a Black Wall Street, it's about building black power. And part of the strategy of black power is to surround all of those bases of black power with white solidarity with black power, with black power and white face. So this is the strategy. And the other thing is that it's, it's weakening, because all white people are, this, are the state, as Chairman Amali Shetela has explained. We are, we're, the, we're all part of the state. And that's why I like it when the chairman says what happened in Ferguson was a white man, a white citizen in a police uniform killed an African. Because what's the difference between that guy or George Zimmerman or the guy in Tallahassee that shot an African because he said his music was too loud? A, a uniform. That's it. We're all part of the state. We all benefit from this reality and are protected by the state. And imperialism, white power, counts on us to carry out their will. We are basically the reserve army of the US, of white power. They count on the complicity of white people. So every white person that joins the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is one less white person they can count on to function as their lynch mob when push comes to shove. The Uhuru Solidarity Movement is our way of saying that we will not be the lynch mob or the cannon fodder or the shock troops of white power this time around. We are, we're, def we're causing a mass defection from the white reserve army of US imperialism with every member and every branch of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And as the African People's Socialist Party is growing and building a revolutionary movement throughout the world, that includes the growth of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. It includes the fact that this event that's happening right here tonight has happened already in St. Louis, in Huntsville, in St. Petersburg, Florida, in Gainesville, in Asheville, that it will happen in Boston, in, it happened in Philadelphia, it'll happen in Portland, it'll happen in Seattle, and it'll happen in Perth, Australia, this event that will be screened in Perth, Australia, and that this is an event which the Solidarity Movement under the leadership of the party has held for over 20 years, including in Poland, in many places throughout the world. Yeah. So that's what this is about. And um, so just to not take up too much time, but to also say that um, a few things about, in terms of saying who we are as the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, I also think it's helpful to say who we're not, what we're not, which we said some of that already. We're not Bernie Sanders. We're not the Democratic Party. We're, we're not an anti-racist organization. That's been touched on tonight. And we say that because, you know, we're not involved in sitting around and trying to unlearn our racism or watch Tim Wise videos or, you know, I don't know, talk about how we felt guilty because our grandmother said something racist at Thanksgiving dinner and we didn't call her out on it, so what do we do? We have to call them, call them in, not call them, and that's not what we're doing. We're not, it's not about just making ourselves feel like we're enlightened white people while nothing in the material world changes. Africans are still getting gunned down every single day in this country or facing all other kinds of colonial hell and we're still living our comfortable white lives. That's not what it's about. We're not. Um, what you know, what they call white allies to people of color, quote unquote, that that basically are just out here to hold Black Lives Matter signs and get our picture taken at demonstrations and do nothing. And we're not a charity organization. We're not. And not only are we not a charity organization, we're the the ultimate anti-charity organization. We want to put charity organizations out of business. Yeah. But that's what they are. They're business. That's, that's all they are. Right. They're a business. And the idea of charity makes no sense in the context of the colonizer is going to be charitable to the colonized. That doesn't even make sense. Our entire material, material existence rests on the suffering, the enforced suffering of African people. How are we going to be charitable? That doesn't mean anything. It means power and control stays in our hands of the resources that we stole from African people and we can scoop off some crumbs off the table every now and then to alleviate only our own guilt a little bit. That's the only suffering that is alleviated by the act of charity is our own guilt. So we're not a charity organization, and we're not white people who want to be black or who are going to start rapping in front of you. Or, that's, not, that's not what we're about. We're not trying to escape that. No. 
<laughs> so that's that's not what this is about. Um, we're not going to start great dancing or anything like that. So because we're ta we're not denying that we're white, we're taking responsibility for the fact that we're white. That's what the party has wanted us to do. So finally, um, I wanted to just list out for you because uh, what I, what we're trying to do with this event is. We don't want people to leave here tonight supporting reparations, period. Because it's got to be more than that. We want you to leave feeling that reparations should be the number one thing in your life from now on. It should be the number one priority in the life of every white person should be reparations. You were born and you're going to die. And in that time span before A and B, it should be reparations, reparations, reparations. That's what every white life should be about. Every white life should be an instrument of the African struggle for reparations. That's what it should be about. I'm going to tell you why. One is because it is, as Chairwoman Penny has eloquently explained, literally the future of the planet Earth as we know it. There will be no future for life on this planet if the African Revolution, and I'm not even going to say if, that if the African Revolution was not successful, okay, there would be no future for this planet. And that's something that even an imperialist entity like the United Nations is trying to say, although they won't say it like that, when they released a report that says the way that abrupt climate change is going now, yeah. by the year 2040, short of a, quote, unprecedented global economic reconfiguration, that things will get so bad that life will not be able to sustain itself on this planet. So a global, an unprecedented global economic reconfiguration is the goal of the Uhuru movement. Yes. So basically what they're saying is, unless the Uhuru movement is successful, there's not going to be life on the planet Earth. Thank you to the United Nations for that admission. Um, secondly, it is the way to end, it is the road to ending all oppression. All oppression. And it's the way that white people can become internationalists and stand in international solidarity with all oppressed peoples throughout the world. Because otherwise, it's false, it's phony to be out there, even to be out there saying free Palestine and walk over the Palestine right here. And we can't do that any longer. The, the war that is fundamental to the functioning of all the other US imperial wars of occupation is the war against African people inside US borders and the war against the indigenous people on whose stolen land we stand right now. So the way to be genuinely anti-war, anti-imperialist, and in solidarity with the Palestinians and with the people of Nicaragua, Venezuela, Yemen, Syria, Korea, and anywhere else on the planet Earth where people are suffering under the yoke of imperialist domination is to stand in solidarity with the African Revolution through reparations. So that's number two. Number three is our fight back as well. It's not something we're doing for someone else. If you're a white person who has any problems with this social system, who has experienced any persecution, oppression, marginalization, then flying a rainbow flag and fighting for the right to join the military or get married is not going to solve that problem. Well, and even if it did, why would we want that? Yeah. And or or the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement is going to end sexual violence in white society. The, if a couple of Hollywood executives lose their jobs, that's going to root out rape culture from a society built on rape, right. built on the rape of African people, African women, that Trump, get Trump out of office because he's a sexual predator. And let's go back to the good old days of Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> who raped a 13-year-old African named, uh, African girl that was enslaved by him named Sally Hemings. America equals rape. So if you want to overturn that, if you want to take a sledgehammer to the skull of rape culture, reparations to African people is how you do that. That's right. Number four, and this is something that the chairman began his presentation with, it is our way into the human family, away from the voluntary exile that we've placed ourselves in for the last 600 years. We put ourselves in a very lonely, despairing, horrible place by separating ourselves from humanity and building a system that requires their oppression for us to exist. What a terrible, I mean, that's a miserable reality. That's why the culture of, of white people is a culture of denial and convenient ignorance and, you know, drug abuse and alcoholism and depression and anxiety and fear and all that. That's, 
that's an, a weird alien society that's separated from the rest of humanity. And we have no idea what it means to be human beings. That's why every white family is messed up. That's why white society is so messed up. It is. We know it. It's because we're separated from the rest of humanity. And the way we can end that, that isolation that we've placed ourselves in is through reparations to African people. And finally, oh, I forgot to say one thing. Also, in terms of, in terms of our fight back, I also did want to mention, just as somebody from a Jewish background being in New York, so there might be some others in here as well, um, that, uh, you know, this thing happened in Pittsburgh recently, and, okay, so I'm a Jewish person and speaking on this, uh, and it's a little disclaimer, not really, it doesn't matter. But, so I'm just, really, the, the coverage of it is making me sick, because it's like, you look at the news and like the second Holocaust has arrived in Pittsburgh in the form of eight Jews being killed. That it's now six million and eight that they want that they want us to be convinced have died at the hands of this. This is the biggest problem in the world is anti-Semitism, quote unquote. And the reason why it offends me is because this happened. The murder of these eight people in that synagogue in Pittsburgh happened in a society built on daily, unspeakable, systematic mass murder and violence against African people, indigenous people, the Palestinians by a Jewish state that flies the Star of David on its flag? Where is the outcry about that? That should make us sick, including especially as Jewish people, we should be sickened by that and not suddenly have an outcry against violence and act like the world is coming to an end when the system of violence that feeds on violence against everybody on the planet non-stop every single day that what that eight Jewish white people experience a taste of that. And the way that any kind of justice for those people could even be achieved would be the destruction of the system, of the social system that rests on violence. So just wanted to say that. And finally, that reparations to African people, it is the, the right thing to do. It is. And this is not, we don't lead with this because you don't even have to be, like the chairman said, he doesn't care what white people feel about African people. It's not about our feelings or anything like that. It's a scientific thing. It's a material, it's in our material interest not to go down with imperialism, but to, to go forward with humanity and with the African revolution. It's also the right thing to do. I mean, we're a lynch mob, slave master, rapist society that carried out hideous, unspeakable crimes against African people. We don't get to just go back into the family and be like, okay, well, it's over now. Like, we have to atone. And the only way we can experience any kind of redemption as human beings is to right the historic wrong. And it, it, is, it is a moral question that we have to face and take responsibility for. So now I'm gonna be joined by uh, Janet Capron, who's a great comrade here in New York, who's gonna talk about our goal tonight, how much money we wanna raise in reparations to African people. And I wanna close by saying that, you know, Reparations to African people is the death blow against capitalism because as Chairman Omali Shatella has said, imperialism cannot survive a successful struggle for reparations. Right. It cannot survive. So what we're about to do is take a dagger to the heart of imperialism and parasitic capitalism. That's what this, uh, this next section of the program is about. So to guide us through the dagger process is Comrade Janet. Thank you.